Hello, LinkedIn, and welcome to a new great episode of Leaders in Supply Chain podcast. It's my pleasure to have with us today another great guest, Tonya Jackson. She is the Senior Vice President and Chief Product Delivery Officer for Lexmark International. Uh, Lexmark is one of the leading companies providing printing and laser imaging solutions and um, products worldwide. Tonya has been with Lexmark for more than 36 years, uh, long, long time, many, many different roles. And currently she's responsible for hardware and supplies development, supply chain manufacturing, as well as service delivery. And from 2016 to 2020, she served as chief supply chain officer responsible for worldwide supply chain operations, as well as the shared service centers for Lexmark. So, Tonya, thanks for joining us. I know it's very early on your side of the of the planet in is in US. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity. Thanks. Um, and maybe you know how we were joking before, but maybe tell yeah. us a little bit about you know how you're putting headhunters out of job, like you know people <laughs> like myself. You know, if if everybody was like you, thirty six years in the same company, then definitely we would be dinosaurs, right? Uh, disappearing right. species. Um, yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'll start with, yeah. I mean, you, you say 36 years somewhere because it's a good place and I, I can't say enough good things about Lexmark and, and the people who work there. So I was explaining that I started um, at IBM uh, in 1985, actually, at, up, in, up in New York out of college. And um, we, um, I moved down to IBM Lexington and then IBM Lexington was a spent, was spun off. Uh, from from IBM and became Lexmark in 1991. So when you add those 30 plus six years together, uh, it comes up to 36. If you knock the thir- six off, it's still 30, still a long time. Uh, so from a, I'll give you a, kind of a quick overview of the jobs real, real, at, at a real high level to see how it all, you know, how the career kind of came together. Um, but I, I, I started in a quality engineering role supporting the manufacturing operations up in New York. And then, um, Moving to Lexington, uh, moved into the R and D team. Uh, we had a another. You mentioned the laser printers. We also made inkjet printers a, a while ago, and that was the division you know that I that I was in. And it was a a bit of a startup within a within a large company. So you got to do a lot of different jobs there because it was just a small division. Uh, so that was where I stayed for I don't know 10, 11 years. And then made a decision. We 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 spent a lot of time at Lexmark on uh, career development, succession planning, all those kinds of things. And I chose a track for more general management, which means um, you know you 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 kind of want to be used in different parts of the business. So you start to rotate around a bit. So I moved to to a, a corporate role. Uh, it was a the uh, sustainability team, and that gave me. Um, and the reason the reason was we was a lot of focus on uh, sustainable product design at the time, and so rather than have purely compliance uh, minded people there, they wanted uh, someone who had been in R and D that could, again, learn a new language on the compliance side, but be able to speak that go back to the R and D team and, and understand what what was needed from a sustainable design perspective. You know, you also got the external. You got, I got to you know meet more customers than I than I would have in, in the R and D role. Um, and internal, I got to present to the board of directors because it was a, um, uh, you know, kind of a, a governance role and from, from a compliance perspective. Um, then moved back to R&D for a while and then moved over to, um, su- to our manufacturing team, um, uh, supplies manufacturing, in fact, which was under the, um, we have an end-to-end supply chain, which we'll, we'll probably get into a little bit. And um, the, that role was under the supply chain organization and uh, then eventually became, you know, uh, to, was able to lead the whole supply chain organization. So um, it, it's been a been a journey, been a lot of fun, met some really interesting people. Um, uh, highly, I highly recommend uh, rotating as you as you can throughout throughout your career. Absolutely. Uh, here, here you go. Wow, 36 years. That is completely unheard of nowadays. Nowadays, maybe, yeah. Yeah. Maybe a younger, a younger viewer. And then David is saying you can safely say you're part of the furniture in the office too. Kudos to you. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's a way to say it. Uh, and I don't know if globally, but here in Asia I've heard it a few times. Um, I guess a question prompts into my mind, Tonya. It might it might not necessarily be easy, but you did mention the part with the 
sustainability and client facing as more as board facing. We've recently written an article on why chief supply chain officers are great to be CEOs. And one of the missing pieces on that article that somebody pointed out is that we should be even more focused on customer facing. So my question to you, if you look back into your career, right, how important was that and how did that play out, right, in terms of having that customer first mentality, I guess, and, and yeah. you know, maybe talk a little bit to that. No, that's a good, it's a good, very good question, because I think, um, you know, it, it, it definitely was a part of the company that I wasn't, well, a part of the whole overall business that I wasn't as exposed to. And so you, you really start to... Uh, you know, a big part of everybody, I think you have to have empathy for what, for, for, for to, to understand where somebody's coming from, right? And that's, that's a lot easier when you actually experience, you know, a, it, when you actually experience that, that opportunity in another area. So I think um, going on, uh, presenting with sales, with uh, my colleagues that were on, that were in sales and, and watching them and understanding their challenges, right? Because when you're in supply chain, you have a view of your challenges and you, you, you have a view of, well, you know, if they only did this or if they only did that, then, you know, your job might be easier. And, and while that could be true, um, everybody's out there, all of us in every company, we are, we are supporting the customer. I mean, that's why we exist. Right. So, so I think it gives you a good feeling of the, um, of that balance between um, trying to stay true to your operations, stay true to what you're trying to do, but also be flexible and understand um, that wherever possible, you're going to, you know, you, you have your processes, but you're also going to try to stretch and try to be as flexible as can, as you can to meet the customer's requirements. So I think mm -hmm. that, that was a, um, a good opportunity for me. And I, and I think, um, you know, it's one of the things, and the other part of that is that you develop a network within the, um, sales organization or or within the sustainability group or within r and d so so when things go when things go wrong or or when you need something quickly, you know you know you have a you have people you can immediately reach out to and then the same way with me they can you know quickly call and say this you know this happened I know it wasn't planned, but you know what can you do those kinds of things mm. And talking a little bit about the structure of the organization, and you know, you mentioned end to end, and your scope is quite large. I mean, you you right. you have product design, you have engineering. It's it's interesting how it seems like you connected the dots, right? So you're yep. you know from where you started to what you are now, it's all kind of coming together, right? Like Steve Jobs said, connecting the dots backwards. <laughs> and I want to link it because we did discuss offline, right? So let's bring that into the discussion in terms of the chip shortages that is affecting most yeah. industries now. And how is that impacting you at, at Lexmark? And then we'll get into also the engineering work yeah, in supply sure. chain. Yeah, I'll give you a little bit of background. So in September of this year, we had a, a, um, a reorganization in the company. Um, we kind of, we, we said we're, we're going to have like three strategic focus areas. And one is the core imaging, which you talked about. It's what we, it's what we do. We're, we're a, a largely a printer manufacturer, printer solutions provider. And then there's a, a second group that's kind of growing adjacencies um, related to how we serve it to, to, our, to our main office offering of uh, managed print services and how we can provide a um, um, services for other other um, aspects of people's of our customers' businesses, and then we have a third group um, called Lexmark Ventures, and so they're out there uh, taking some of the technology that we have and using it in other applications. So for the core imaging, we put together um, the R and D team. The former, the, so, so the R&D team, the supply chain team, and the service delivery team. And so that group um, is all things related to providing the best customer experience uh, on the imaging side. So going from, um, you know, we have a portfolio enablement team, which means what products are we going to design, build, how many SKUs, those kinds of things. I mean, we don't decide the SKUs on our own. You, you work in marketing for that, but really how can we service that? How can we um, best manufacture that? How can we keep it out in the field? How do we service it? Um, how do we refurb it? How do we return it? All of those types of things. So it was a, it, it, the group is, um, uh, it was, you know, kind of cultures coming together because you can imagine every group has a, a bit of a different culture. Uh, I can tell you the crisis and the crisis you know, and supply chain has been ongoing now, but but the um, the semiconductor crisis in particular has really um, uh, brought the team together because you have 
um, what, what I talked to you about, you, 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 we have this shortage right now that's going on. And so you have the sourcing team out doing all kinds of spot buys and trying to find, you know, alternative parts. And at the same, and then the, the, the nice thing about this organization, uh, first of all, it starts with fantastic people, but what comes, what, what they're looking at is real time. The engineers are saying, are helping this sourcing team make decisions on parts. You should buy this part, not that part. If we buy this, what can we do? Uh, lots of work uh, looking at the, uh, the the printed circuit board layouts and those types of things. So we're able to be um, uh, much more flexible, uh, much more agile uh, as a as a joint organization. It could have worked without, you know, it would have it would have worked uh, either way. I, I'll be I'll be honest, uh, but I think it's you can we can make those trade offs much quicker. Uh, at, since we're all together and deciding workload and, and splitting out, you know, assignments and those types of things. And and I, I recently saw um, back to the SNOP, right? I guess the forever, forever fight, war, rivalry, whatever you want to call it, right? Uh, it tends to be fairly negatively perceived, right, between sales and operations oh. supply chain, right? And there was. <laughs> There was somebody that they were wrestling. I think there was a picture that I saw recently. So you talked about engineering and, and supply chain working closely, right? Which sometimes that's that's a fight in itself. Yep. How do you communicate with the sales, right? So you, you spoke yeah. about the past, right? Oh, Going yeah. to meetings with sales. How do you kind of continue with your team, right? How do you make sure that they kind of understand and speak the same language as the sales teams? Absolutely. So uh, we, it, again, this crisis has brought us all together uh, a lot closer. We have um, weekly, I, like SNOP is a process, right? And and what we are doing right now is, um, I, I'd say we are we're we're meeting much more frequently between actually it's finance, uh, sales, and then you know the product delivery team, my team, to understand uh, product allocation, because uh, we're we're in the electronic space, and and you know there's thousands of components that are um, unavailable right now, right? And and varying degrees of availability thousands of components that go across the product line. And so we're trying, we are deciding which products we build with the components that we have based on customers, uh, based on profitability, based on, you know, a, a host of things. So, so it's a, it's a, it's a matter of, um, you know, meeting weekly and saying, this is what, you know, how to set production, what are we going to build? What do you need? Uh, which customers are first, those kinds of, those kinds of things. So the alignment has, um, has gotten better again. It's it's a uh, you know it, it it's it's very um, it's a tough operating environment right now. So everybody is trying to make you know trying their very best to make things work for the customer. So it's going it's it's um, it, there's a lot going on, but I, I can tell you the alignment is is very good. You know I also you know spend some time. <laughs> Another thing that we do with my leadership team, we take the sales leadership team that we work to. Uh, to lunch every now and again, right? So it's you know we we like to uh, we, we like to keep them happy and uh, let them know we're working as hard as we can. It's tough, right? You you if you're in sales, you want product, right? You you've made the sale, you want product, and and it's difficult for us too because we want to be able to execute and provide. It's just very difficult operating environment right now. And I'll pick a question from Srini. I guess it's something that is pretty much on everybody's strategy or change of strategy, right? How have sourcing patterns? I guess, if any, changed for the long term, uh, you know, yep. um, due to the chips crisis. Yeah. So I think what you will, you know, you see um, um, from a sourcing perspective, you'll see some of the, the major suppliers starting to add capacity. That's not a short term solution, but that that will help over time. Uh, you will probably see people um, change their inventory policies and those types of things. The challenge is that there's so many different um, electronic components. You can't, I'd say you can't buffer your way out of this, right? You can't do that. So what, one of the things that we are, what everybody typically does is try to, you know, dual source or, or, or have multiples or have at least, you know, two or three sources. We're finding that's not enough on some of these, um, what we call components that are deep in the supply chain. You're, 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 um, your, your really um, critical technology components, yeah, you can probably live with a dual source and, and, and get through it. But honestly, in, in what's happening right now, some of the like commodity level electronics is, is what's uh, tougher to find for some of, uh, of some of our boards. So what we're doing again, going back to the engineering team is working with the engineering team and, and trying to design, 
look look at designs. It won't help us today, but going forward, um, how can we really be as uh, the word may be vanilla or off the shelf as possible uh, from a packaging perspective. Sometimes you have the electronic component, but then the packaging around it, bothered, you know, is, is is unique or special. So how can we lay out the boards so that we are much more flexible? Um, you know, two two is not enough. You know, you need something that you know maybe you've got five or six suppliers that can that can provide this device, and maybe that means your board layout is maybe not as um, you know, cost effective as you would like. And, and that's some of the reasons, I mean, the, the engineers are wonderful and they're doing things for, for function, for cost and all those kinds of things. But you, we've got to figure out how to, how to uh, balance that trade off a bit more uh, in order to, to get through these kinds of, these kind of crises. So it's not, you, you can't just uh, source your way out of it. There's gotta be some engineering help as well. And to this point with the sourcing, dual sourcing, I had a recent conversation with the current member now the company, but anyways, the, the point was they had dual sourcing, right? Yeah. Uh, in theory, it seems like they, they're protected somewhat. <laughs> and then when they look deeper, I think this was tier two, three, I don't know, anyways. And once they look at tier four, they figured that both the sources had the same, <laughs> for certain components, had the same provider. So yeah, you're dual sourcing, yes. but in actual fact, you're not. Because <laughs> if that tier four, falls then yep. basically both your sources fall right so right uh, and, and you told me offline right about how you build your own so let's let's talk maybe yeah. now uh live, you know, right, about that you're you're exactly right i think one of the things that i'll go back to the original that, that that other question i think you know you can fool yourself with dual sourcing or you can be because you know supply chains most supply uh, nearly all supply chains are built with these these tiers right so you send the signal to the tier one they send a signal to tier two and then they they send it. it. There's a time lapse where they send it back and then it goes to tier three and it goes and so forth. And to your point, some of these tier twos are getting uh, they're the next level. They're sharing suppliers. Right. So you're up here at tier one. And you have no idea uh, what's going on you know, behind that. And you and so what we have had uh, and it's and it's very slow. And when you have products that share. Uh, some of these um, deep level, uh, these, these uh, components down in the tiers. And then you've got an even, even bigger problem because there, there's some products that you think you can build, but, oh, they, they do, they share those components. And if you're, if you're short, then you've got a bigger problem. So what we, we, um, we quickly discovered that we needed to get better visibility down the tiers, right? Um, uh, because our supplier, because, because right now lead times are moving. It, every, this is, I'm not saying anything every, uh, people don't know, but the lead times move as fast as they've moved from, you know, eight weeks to 17 to 24 to 52 weeks. The suppliers systems can't respond fast enough to those changes. Um, and the, the signals are all jumbled. So what we, we did was, was we developed a tool to connect our bill of materials uh, across all of the product lines um, and to maximize like that, to, to, to understand where all these components are used. So we can see uh, all the way down the supply chain and, and, and it's regardless of where, the, um, where, these, where, where these components are actually going. So the, the supplier that I'm dealing with, supplier X doesn't have the visibility. I, I have, we have visibility to all of the components. That supplier X only has visibility to their components. And they may be short or they may be slow or the lead times may be moving, but we can see those components now at another supplier. And then, and this is not easy, but then we can move them. We can say, okay, you're short, but they're sitting over here. This supplier is very vertical. They can only see what's in their lane. We're able to see everything because, you know, a supply base is a, is a network, right? So we see that there's components over here, this supplier, and then we, you know, you do your negotiations. I need, I need you to move this over here. Without that tool that we have, uh, our, we, we would be basically blind uh, right now. Now, I'd say this is unprecedented times. In general, it works, right? Because there's a, there's a very standard lead times and things are, are I, I wouldn't say ever normal in operations, but, but, you know, they're workable. But right now, with everything being so um, chaotic and, and, um, unpredictable um we just can't rely on the uh, visibility that our tier one supplier supplier has and that, that doesn't mean they're not good suppliers it's just very difficult times uh, right now so we want to yeah i was going to say we've taken we we, we we talk about big data a lot when you talk about the data in in supply chain with all the, with all the components 
is big data. And we, we talk about doing things with big data. The team, uh, the uh, very talented team that, that I'm working with, they've taken big data and just made it something manageable so that we can see where all these components are, what can we build with, with, with the stack of components that we have. But where I want to double double click a little bit, uh, there, there's there's of course a lot of software companies, right? That that yep. you know depends who you ask. They say they're the best in the world, uh, you know, depending you know yep. visibility and, and IBP and, and and big data and yep. AI and machine learning. They throw all these terms around, and some are very good. Um, it's interesting that you went down the path of you know uh, creating your own, right? So I guess right. maybe tell us a little. A little bit. What's the advantages in this? I mean, there's always two sides to the coin, right? Yep. So maybe yep. tell us more. Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm going to start out by saying, first of all, we had to. We don't. We didn't have time to go out and, you know, partner with someone and provide them all our data, and we didn't have time because we needed to continue to provide for our customers, right? So part of it was out of out of necessity. Um, I'd say the the other thing is. We've looked at some tools in the past, and um, there's a lot of to us, and 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 happy to to talk to people who have a different experience. A lot of it is uh, visibility um, through distribution. So you know, where's your product uh, on the way to? Right? Uh, you know, you you've, you've you've assembled it, and where is it on the water? Where is it on the you know on the road? All those, all those kinds of things. Deep into the supply chain, um, meaning you know, down to tier tier ten. Uh, we haven't seen um, as much uh, intelligence there. It's hard. I mean, it's 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 it's, it's pretty difficult. Um, and and maybe we need to do a better job of of uh, at when this is over with, of of comparing. You know what's out there available. But for us, uh, we had to have something now. And um and 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 we're not the the other piece of it is we weren't um, let's say designed to go off and you know have people's eyes on every single component that, that we needed. And this is largely in the electronic space. I mean, some of the other components obviously a lot are, are much more um, normal right, right now. So for us, it was out of, to answer your question, it was out of necessity um, that we had to, to get better at this. To go back to your, your question about the sales team, we needed to be able to tell them that with more um, certainty when they were gonna have products and without any visibility we just were too far off and, 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 you know, we, if we had installations and rollouts and those kinds of things, we, we had, we had to get better at communicating with the customer. So, so mainly it was out of necessity. And the second thing is we haven't seen any, any, any tools that can give us our total lay of the land um, down to those suppliers that we would normally not have eyes on. No, but T Tony, you talked about uh, Lexmark Ventures, right? So now, yep. free of charge for you because you came to the podcast, you should now take the tool, give it to the guys that do the <laughs> ventures, and start selling it. <laughs> Funny you say that. I've I've, I've talked to uh, I, I've actually talked to the uh, the head of, of ventures, and and I've kind of kitted with our system with our the the um the fantastic engineers and the and the data analysts and the uh, supply chain. It's been you know the other thing the people that developed it. You've got an engineer that's looking at all the components. You've got a supply chain expert who set up, you know, suppliers in the past, and they did all of the data analytics and building this tool. And then we had a planner, right, who has to plan parts to to say this is all cool. I can't use this. So to to sit down with them and say this is how I plan. So they were iterating on the tool the entire time because you can develop something that's unusable, that's really cool, but nobody can use it, right? <laughs> so we had the planner come in and, and uh, work with them and they did some re redesigning and all those kinds of things so that it, it's not, now now all pla now planners, all planners can actually use it. So what we need, what I said we need on top of this is somebody in UX to come in to your point and then let's put a, let's put a face on this and, and so that, uh, um, you know, we can, we can share it. Uh, but, no, but, but that, that sometimes, or a lot of times, so what I've seen in terms of a lot of startups where they fail, right? And there's a lot of very young, dynamic, not so young as well, but very tech-focused talent out there. To your point, they come and design the best technology, throw all these buzzwords again, AI, ML, whatever, machine learning, <laughs> whatever, right? But they fail to, I, I don't know, I mean, I don't, when you have a box and it's stuck in the port and there's a guy that has to sign a paper, they don't understand that, right? And then the right. system does right. not account for that. And then it breaks down because they didn't actually, I mean, they don't understand how it works in practicality, yes. right? 
in theory, yes. a lot of things work. In practice, no, they don't. So, we, so it, well, you know, it's it's, uh, it's funny because when we were then the, the team was developing it, we were you know they they were held up in a room, socially distanced, of course. And uh, when I saw the tool, everybody was so excited about it. It was like, wow, this, we can finally see what's down there. And the, our 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 planner, the lead planner, I won't, I won't mention her name on this podcast, but I love her. She said, I can't use this. You know, so <laughs> she said, I mean, I, you have to be sitting right beside me to tell me what to click, you know. And so she said, this is not not helpful. So then it was like, well, what do you need? And so they spent another few days and, and it came out in a very different place. But I, that was important because we we were we had been operating and we continued operating operate with um, I say you know open communication full transparency you know if it's it, let's not you know mince words if something isn't working let's say it's not working right uh, so I think there's a, a a good culture that we have where people were really digging in and trying to develop this as fast as possible but also to say this is nice but. I need something else, right? And so, so the three of the the three that that group between the planners, the the engineers, and the supply chain people just put out a they they did a couple of iterations and they've got they've got a pretty they've got a really good tool now. Now the, the issue is I, I like to say uh, before we were blind and couldn't didn't know what was behind tier one. Now we can see it's not good, right? We can see the problems now, right? It's very vis very visible where you can see what you're missing. And so what we built into the tool is. Okay, we got gaps of supply here, but then you go in and say, "Well, I got spot buys to cover this." Or will a spot is a spot buy enough? Like because you don't want to buy something and you still got a hole at another component. So you're able to say, "Should I make this spot buy versus this?" And will this keep me whole from a product perspective? Can I have? Can I find an alternate? Uh, you know, alternate part. Um, when can I? When am I going to make up lead time? So you can lay that into the tool to say to make. You know financial decisions on what should you go off and and chase because everybody's you know spending more money than than we should right now because we we have to in order you know it's just it's just just that kind of a market yeah now look uh, some great comments waitron is a uh, is a dear contact of ours she, he's uh, the leader of uh, uh on the supply chain side of the economic development board of singapore so some good, ah. some good feedback we, we might take this as a case study nice. uh, for some of the practitioners i'd love here. for you to do it it's uh i mean it it was i think um you know you you what, what we had quite honestly was a false sense of security because our tier ones, when, when all of this, you know, kind of chaos happened, is that they were getting signals that everything's good, because they they thought they were. But then the lead times moved, and then it was like weeks, a couple of weeks. <laughs> and then something. Mm. So I was, you know, I, I we were blind, like we were we were just blind to what was going on. And now we can see. It's not you. Know, I'm not going to say it's. <laughs> you're, we're seeing a pretty picture. Pretty. We're seeing things that can be solved now or not, right? You know, okay, well, I've got this problem before you just you just. You had a sense of security. You're like the ostrich. You're like the ostrich, head head in the yeah, sand and hoping right. the best. But like, yeah, everybody know. was working as hard as they could, but you were getting surprised constantly, right? And so now you know, eyes wide open. Where's my hole, and and how can I go solve it? And I'll pull a question from Mike. You spoke a little bit of the stocking, so I'll focus on the transportation side of things, specifically also because it's it's a mess. It's a major mess at the moment. We talked also, you know, there's a new port that goes goes offline. There's a new thing. There's a new strike. There's a God knows, right? But container prices are are higher than Bitcoin is, right? So <laughs> talk to, talk a little bit to the transportation side. Uh, yeah. So I would say I have we. We are like everyone else here, and looking at uh, increasing rates and those types of types. You know, trying to decide: do you do you lock into a contract for some period of time, or do you continue to play the spot market? Those kinds of things. I don't have any. I have no no uh, tool or no magic developed there. Uh, we're just um, uh, trying to stay with our. I guess our strategy is to continue with the the port strategy that we have because we've looked at moving. You know, trying to come in and come in with different ports, and the the rates aren't the 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 um land the lead time increases a bit for us, and the and the uh, rates aren't that much that much more. So we we've been working with our with our um, logistics providers um, to secure containers um, and to secure lanes and those types of things, and we are doing you know everything we can to optimize um, uh, for the you know for the for the um, uh, uh, containers, but uh, it's we're just waiting like everyone else for this to settle to settle out. The the time if if the, if the question is about um, um, 
lead times and predictability. Um, we are um, not as predictable as we would like to be. It seems to be getting better on the uh, from on the West Coast a bit uh, in terms of the standard deviation, you know, the the, the, the deviation from uh, uh, from normal, but it's still it's still longer than what we've than what we've seen. Containers are not where they're supposed to be. You know, every, we're 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 kind of in the same boat. Um, so basically, I, I I would say we're competing like everybody else, paying more than. Um, then certainly we want to, but trying to really optimize the um, uh, the um, uh, packaging so that we can, when we find a container, we can, you know, we make sure we get the most, uh, the squeeze, most the, yes, the space. squeeze them in as best we can. Um, question, uh, moving a little bit on the people side, right? And, yeah. um, and, and you spoke, uh, you spoke uh, you spoke to to team being key um tell us a little bit uh, i guess um what else do you see in terms of building great teams maybe there's a is there a secret sauce is there a combination of hard skills and soft skills you know talk talk a little bit to that yeah um i think so it, it really the great team starts with you know really good uh, it's, this is no secret really good people and uh, the the there's a combination certainly of, uh, of of technical skills that people um you know have but but and 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 that people can learn uh for for the folks in supply chain well i, I think it's really true of every of everybody especially in this this era era you got to be i like to focus on a learning um a learning organization we talk about risk taking and those kinds of things uh, but from for uh, it's, it's similar to me, but I'll twist it a little bit. Um, I want to always make sure that we are as as leaders are or or if, if we get ideas and those kinds of things, instead of asking why, we're saying why not. That sounds reasonable. Let's go try it. And the more you try things and you learn from them, surely you're going to fail with something. But you really don't learn. You don't, you don't learn new things unless you go off and pilot things and and, and experiment. Um, because I think in operations, you can get really good at turning the crank um, and you can get um, you, you figure it out. Right. But you do it the hard way. So I think for me, it's important to, to make sure that we allow uh, good ideas to be heard, you know, especially in times like this. There's nobody out there that has done has been through anything like this before. So we should all be will, will, willing to listen to, to new ideas. And they're not all going to going to work. But the more we listen then that learning that becomes part of the culture where people can go back and say, hey, I was empowered to try this. I, I, I tried this and hey, it didn't work. Or I tried this and it did work. And people, you know, you, you build optimism and uh, and people feel like they're really a part of the team because everybody, everybody in, in any kind of operation is working for the customer. Right. And so everybody wants to be successful. So for me, it's, it's about um, giving people, um, you know, the ability to, to try new things and Again, it doesn't mean everything's going to work, but we learn something in the process. Mm. And how do you keep yourself? This also popped into my mind as we were speaking. How do you keep yourself on top if there's such a thing? I don't know if any of us is on top, but current, right? With so many changes, new technologies, new software, new solutions, you know, I mean, is there a preferred way in which you extract the gist of information or is there some subscription? Is there books that you read? I'm just curious. How do you? Kind of keep learning uh, yourself. There's a lot out there right now. You know, it's, I mean, it's it's um I I do you know you know because Google is Google. Once you start clicking on things, they they tend to send you more, right? So I I do try to follow trends, um, you know, in 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 supply chain and in in R and D and all and and in just kind of a customer delivery overall. Um, we have uh, things that I'm that I don't understand. I really try to find people who do. Uh, or people who are kind of on that leading edge. A lot of the things that you mentioned, AI and, and, and machine learning and all those kinds of things, we have people in our company that um, are very good at it. And so we try to, well, we, we have what's called the lunch and learn. I'm sure it can be called different things at different companies, but we try to have sessions uh, with um, uh, experts in other parts of the business to talk to the, to the uh, product delivery team um, on just... Um, you know what they're doing in, in their business and how it might and how we can maybe perhaps use some of that technology because right now there's so much uh, people are getting slammed uh you know right and left and so they need you know they need that they don't have time on their own sometimes so we try to create and i try to create uh these 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 uh um these lunch and learn so that 
you can just kind of sit back for, you know, an hour, take something else in and perhaps, you know, noodle on it and say, this is how I might apply it, you know, to my problem or, or have uh, these, these experts maybe come back and say, well, and present them with the problem now that you kind of understand a little bit about what they do. So for me, it's about, you know, kind of keeping up on the internet, but also using um, either uh, people in a in my external network to to understand what they're doing, but certainly we have just a lot of different people within Lexmark that have that are on this emerging uh, uh, technology, and they understand and they learn it. And there's no reason for me to try to learn it, right? I bring them in and then and, and we we talk it through. Hank, if you are able to develop your own tool for visibility, I tell you, you're, you know, I mean, I, I'm telling you, that was out of desperation. I, I, I will come as an intern, right? Uh, you know, we're supposed to be headhunters. I'm going to come as an intern, though it might not be safe. I don't promise it's I, safe you, for your people. You would be amazed. You, you would be amazed what you do out of, uh, you know, you know, desperation. You, you want to serve the country, so it's like I got to figure something else out. I can't sit here. I got to figure this out. <laughs> and another right technology right what is in your view within the realm of supply chain end to end supply chain right r and d what is one that is underrated and one that is overrated you know putting you on maybe it's a hard question but what's underrated in your mind but also what's overrated in what 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 is this in technology or in opera what in technology in technology in, in general technology. right so you can talk you know i throw you with just random what blockchain is, or whatever what I, mean, I don't want to put words oh. into your mouth right but yeah <laughs> yeah i think we talked about this one um I, I i i it's hard for me to say overrated i just haven't quite figured it out in in terms of how we should leverage it and that's blockchain and 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 those types of technology i just i we i i study it i haven't quite figured it out yet. Uh, it's, hard, it's hard for me to say it's underrated, let's say I don't, that's, uh, I mean, overrated, that's it, let's say I don't understand it. You know, I'd say the um, underrated, it's, it's, this is not so much a technology, and I'm, I'm going to change your question a little bit. I, I'm going to say what's underrated is uh, communication to get to the technology, meaning communication coming where we started, between the the groups, like the sales team, they have a demand, they have a they have a technology to get the demand planning. Um, the supply chain is looking at the supply side and all those all of these tools are coming together. But I think I think the communication between the, the teams, there's a way to link those those two all of that all of that data, all of the all of that technology. So I think that's kind of an opportunity if we can figure out um, because we do speak different languages. And how, but we've we've got data. The data the data is fine. But if we can figure out the communication to connect that those two those two uh, technologies together, I think I think you got something there. Great, great point, Tony. Final question for me. Uh, one piece of advice for the younger listeners, maybe from your career, right? If you were to look back, something that helped you the most, what what is it? What would you say? My my long career. Yeah, it, it's for me. It's if you're offered a leadership um, opportunity. Uh, especially, I mean, outside of your course, I'm going, if you're, no matter what area you're in and you, you are offered something outside of your core skill set, you've been, a, you've been successful in, in a core skill set. Somebody says, Hey, I want you to go try this. You should not blink. You should go for it. If you're interested, if you're interested, don't just say, yeah, I'll do anything. But if you're interested, don't hesitate. Um, I would say it, 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 it allows you a couple of things. You, you get, you get outside of your comfort zone. And you have that balance of excitement and fear, which is, well, I'm, I'm saying that for myself. I have a balance of excitement and fear, and that's just about right. But what what it does when you when you make that first move outside of your core skill set, you you start to you, you start to ride a change wave, right? And you and, and that's like maybe for the first time, and you go through all of those emotions of you know you you feel inadequate. You used to be good at this, but now you don't know how to do this, and all those types of things. But you develop. Um, a muscle for that. And so the next time that you're doing something, you, you're still as uncomfortable, but you know, you can get through it and you know what that looks like. And you give yourself a lot more grace. You're not as hard on yourself, right? Because uh, it's like, oh, I've seen this. I know what this feels like. So I, I think people um, fear what they don't know and, um, or, or they, you know, change is, change is just good and being uncomfortable is good. So uh, don't back down from an opportunity because you, you know, you're not, you don't know much about it. That's an opportunity to learn and an opportunity to learn how to learn. Lovely. I love the message, uh, Tony. Well, on, the, on that note, very grateful for your uh, sharing and uh, very practical, uh, down-to-earth, uh, 
easy to take home. I think the audience, we've had a lot of comments, I'll take you separately as well, uh, took uh, took a lot. Um, we'll definitely do something here in Singapore and, and share your case study with the economic <laughs> would love development. To do that. I would love to do that. I think we've got something. <laughs> again, again, it might be, it's, it's homegrown. And, and maybe, you know, maybe the, the, the two of us go and set up a startup and all we do it as part of the Lexmark and, and market um, market the software. But I, I definitely think that, that you've got uh, you've got something. Uh, usually the UX is uh, sometimes easier to do because it's, well, you know, you, know it's back you, back. Should, you should really do UX from the beginning. So, <laughs> so right. In but, an ideal world, but, but, uh, it, it's, but you know, um, sometimes no, you I have very that. fancy dashboards, but actually you, you lack the back end, right? So it's, you know, it's a funny how these things work. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, anyways, thanks a lot. Stay healthy, Tonya. And, Thank you. Thank uh, you for the opportunity. See you, see you soon. All right. Thanks.